Good afternoon, everyone. I'll kick off very shortly. I'm just watching people come in. Wait until it slows down and then I'll, uh, and then I'll make a start. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first of three days of discussion on Beyond Measure, Research and Evidence in Culture and Health. My name is Erica Ramsey. I'm a project manager within the Cultural Institute at the University of Leeds, and I've been the project manager on Beyond Measure. I'll talk a bit more about the programme shortly, but first, just some quick housekeeping things. Um, participants' cameras are off and microphones are muted. Please feel free to put your camera on if you want to. We are recording the event and it will be shared later on the Beyond Measure website and the Cultural Institute YouTube channel. Uh, when we upload it, it will be a ca captioned version. Uh, we encourage you to use the hashtag Beyond Measure on Twitter if you're tweeting today and also uh, to say that you can use the chat function if you wish to share any relevant links or comments. Um, today's session will include an opportunity to ask questions of our panellists. If you've got a question, please use the Q&A function. Uh, if you'd rather be anonymous in your question, please tick that box when, when prompted. And to help our chair, Victoria, to get through the questions from the audience, please be concise. So we're aiming to wrap up the talks no later than about 1.30 to allow a good time for Q&A from our audience today. Fingers crossed we won't have any technical issues, but if you are struggling with something, please drop my colleague Nicola Casse or Yasmin Sidani, um, who's under Cultural Institute uh, on the uh, attendee list today. Please drop them a private message in the chat and they will do their very best to help you. Before I hand over to today's, to today's chair, I'd like to give a really brief overview of the Beyond Measure programme. Beyond Measure is a programme of events co-produced with LAWN, which is the Leeds Arts, Health and Wellbeing Network and Centre for Cultural Value based at University of Leeds. We began in May by asking people what topics they'd be interested to see covered under the broad umbrella of research and evidence in culture and health. In July, we distilled these suggestions into three Twitter chats, one which was on the role of artist practitioner, which was chaired by Nicola Naismith, one on ethics and equity, which was chaired by Mafwa Theatre based in Leeds, and one on unpicking who research and evidence is for, which was chaired by the Centre for Cultural Value and the Audience Agency. You can catch up with these discussions online and read reflective blogs, which were written by the hosts. In June, we invited artists to creatively respond to the themes of Beyond Measure, and we were lucky enough to be able to commission 10 responses covering media such as ceramics, dance, excuse me, gardening and poetry. And I urge you to have a look at the gallery on the Beyond Measure website to see more of what was produced. Just finished this week, we've had a program of creativity on prescription facilitated by Leeds based artist, The Art Doctors, which was for a small cohort of health sector professionals and trainees who are undertaking action research to understand more about how creativity can make a difference to their personal and professional lives. And we look forward to sharing a video and article about this project towards the end of the week. So please make sure you signed up to the Beyond Measure newsletter to receive updates on that. This week, we have another event tomorrow, chaired by Rob Webster from Southwest Yorkshire NHS Foundation Trust, which is on the nature of collaboration in um, arts and, and arts and health. And on Thursday, we're lucky enough to have a conversation between Darren Henley, CEO of Arts Council England, and Daisy Fancourt of UCL, who, as most of you will know, is a renowned researcher in, in the area of arts and health. Uh, so please do register for those events. If, you are, if you're interested, we'd love to see you there. So, uh, Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to today's chair. She is Victoria Hume. She is director of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. And we're really delighted to have her here today. And I'll let her introduce herself in a bit more detail. Over to you, Victoria. Thanks, Erica. It's great to be here. I'm yeah, really happy to be part of this series of events. It's been amazing over the last <clears throat> little while to have this going on. Um, so yes, my name is Victoria Hume. I'm the director of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. I'm um, really happy to be chairing today's panel and the topic is what is it about art and culture that can make a difference to our health? We have some amazing panellists who are going to help us answer that question. Uh, Dr Mo Sattar, who's a GP in Leeds with a keen interest in the arts and his own weekly radio show. David McQuillan, who's the Arts and Health Programme Manager for South West Yorkshire NHS Foundation Trust. Angela Awur, who is the founder and CEO of Mental Health The Arts. Norma Dakin, who's Professor in New Social Research at Tampere University in Finland. 
and Mike and Helen Thompson, who are described as serial attenders and organisers of the cultural engagement programmes in Leeds. So each of our panellists is going to um, talk briefly in response to the question, and then we'll just have a bit of a discussion amongst ourselves, and after that an opportunity for questions from you all. Um, before I hand over to them, I'm just going to very briefly introduce the work of the Culture, Health and Wellbeing Alliance. So we are a free to join national membership organisation. We've got 5,000 members. We seem to be growing by about 100 members a month at the moment, which is great and very much indicates how, um, how much interest there is in this area of work. Our vision is a healthy world powered by our creativity and imagination. And we're an organisation that's very much driven by the collective power of our members. Uh, we're tiny in terms of resource, there's just two part-time members of staff, but we have this um, amazing body of experience which we hope to, to share with policymakers and researchers and commissioners to make sure that uh, practice remains connected to policy really. Um, our members cover a huge range of practice from artists working in hospital settings to community arts organisations, museums, academics and obviously our colleagues in health and social care, local government. Uh, we're founded by Arts Council England as a sector support organisation for the cultural sector but to do that in any way effectively we, we need to be working across all those sectors at a regional, national and local level. So we have regional champions around the country, um, an arts champion and a museums champion in each of the English regions and we work very closely with the LENS which is the lived experience network and that's um, focused on ensuring that the voice of lived experience of the impacts of the arts, culture, creativity on our own health and well-being is at the centre of practice and policy. Um, this year we, repeat, we released a report, this is, so this is the beginning of me trying to sort of say some things in relation to that, to that opening question, what is it about the arts? Um, we released a report in July that looked at the work of 50 organisations that carried on delivering through lockdown and were specifically focusing on people shielding at home uh, with creative activities. And these organisations use partnerships with health, with local government, with social workers to get creative packs into food parcels, to reach people at home with online work, with postal work, with phone based work. Um, one of the key themes that came out was that this was really about maintaining relationships for many people with groups that had come together initially to do creative activities or to support museums as volunteers. But in many case, this, cases, this creative aspect of it initially was secondary to being able to keep contact with people by phone or Zoom or post, whichever it was, to make sure that these groups knew that they were still in touch with each other. Really, the relationships became the point, certainly at the beginning of lockdown. And I've mentioned that um, we have members who work in a huge range of ways with the arts, but it's also about types of creativity that perhaps haven't been traditionally seen as professional art making. So cooking, work in nature, walking. Uh, it's very clear from recent studies like the COVID social study that Daisy Fancourt is leading through the March network. That for most of us, there isn't a, a particularly firm line between things like reading and music making and cookery and gardening, if we're lucky enough to have the space to do that. And when it comes to protecting our mental health during COVID, all of these activities have a protective effect, whereas not surprisingly, keeping up with the COVID news is detrimental. Voluntary Arts just released a report based on their investigations into how creative activity is supported particularly in areas of deprivation. And one of its findings is that at a community level, people see creative and cultural activity as being totally intertwined with priorities around volunteering, sport, exercise, and not necessarily separated from one another. So to quote the report, this raises the question that if government sees these sectors as separate and people just see community, how can that work in practice? So I'm going to leave it on that open question and I'll introduce our panellists one by one for their um, responses to the question. Uh, and our first panellist is Dr Mo Satter. Mo, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit more and give us your thoughts? Thank you. And um, uh, thank you to, to the team for inviting me. I'm really delighted to talk um, today. And I think it's really important that um, that everybody on the, the webinar today hears from um, somebody who really is on the front line and also in touch with um, other uh, areas of health within the city 
Uh, I'm Dr. Morsata. I'm a job in GP a partner at the Woodhouse Medical Practice. Um, I also do lots of other things, <laughs> as Victoria and Erica have said. I also do um, weekly uh, radio on um, radiation fever. Um, I also uh, serve as a trustee at St. Gemma's Hospice and also at Feel Good Factor, a health and wellbeing charity. Um, and so I feel that uh, I'm in touch with um, with what really is going on in the city, not only as a clinician, uh, but also in terms of a charity third sector, um, and also um, really, really advocating for um, uh, our marginalized communities and bringing people uh, together. I tweeted this morning uh, something that I really, really believe, uh, which is that no man is really happy or safe without a hobby. And William Osler said that uh, once he's uh, considered to be the father of, um, of medicine as we know it. Um, and I really, really believe that. The radio airwaves at Fever FM every Saturday have kept me sane. Um, and uh, so I, I thought I'd share that with you. I've got um, three slides to, um, uh, to, to, to talk through and then I do have another meeting um, but I welcome any questions that, um, uh, that our audience have if you get them to me and I will definitely um, uh, come back to them. I want to give you three examples of how we've used arts in our organisation uh, to help people. Uh, last year we underwent a, uh, a refurbishment programme at our branch surgery the exterior was red and black. That to me equals danger. Now it's blue and green. And as part of our, um, our refurbishment programme, I really looked at what is the patient's journey? How do I make people feel comfortable uh, to talk about their health and really share their experiences when they come in to see us? Simon Lewis uh, is, is part of this, this uh, uh, sort of uh, team as well. I, I, and, and it's through sort of Twitter handles and sort of communication through uh, the, the, the arts network that I've been able to get in contact with Simon. And Simon um, has come along to our surgery and he's placed pictures like these uh, on our walls. And what a fabulous thing it is. So people have commented on it, patients, when they're walking through our, you know, down our corridors. But one of the things that has really helped is that Simon has very kindly said that if someone buys a print, then he will make a donation to our coffee morning. Our coffee morning is free on a Thursday morning. It was set up really when I was really struck and moved by a patient of mine who has advancing dementia and really used to come to see me every week because she said, you're the only person that doesn't talk to me like I'm a three-year-old. And I realized that we needed a coffee morning. And uh, during that coffee morning, we do lots of amazing things, obviously on hold, but it's fantastic. By using the arts, we've been able to perhaps have a bank of money that we can invest in our coffee morning. And artists like Simon Luce have made that possible. So I'm really grateful to Simon. And I wanted to share that as a, a, a way of how we've made uh, arts part and parcel of what we're doing. It works both ways. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, my interest is end of life care and how do we help people to live whilst they're living, but also when they are coming to the end of their life, how do they have um, a, a good death and a death that they had hoped for, which is uh, wholesome, supportive, um, and um, uh, part and parcel of hospice uh, care is the arts. And, you know, that's where I've been exposed to real arts as a clinician. You know, often I used to uh, end my shift at St. Christopher's Hospice in Sydney in London. Um, and I used to come down and in the day centre, I used to see people drawing. And it might have been a different group, so a bereavement group, it was children, all sorts of expressions of grief through people's arts. This book written by Nigel Hartley, who is a good friend of mine, and he's also the chief executive of the Isle of Wight uh, Hospice, 
uh, I uh, encourage you all to have a look at that. Next slide, please. I put out a call at our main branch, uh, at our uh, main site, Woodhouse Medical Practice. Uh, as I walked through, we had um, sort of canvases on the walls, which were dreadful, I'm sorry to say. They were really dull. They made me feel so depressed. Um, and there were words like suicide and, you know, really dark sort of, that's, a, I suppose, an expression from somebody and I'm grateful for them to have done it. But I thought we need to have a change. I put a call out. My sister is a secondary school teacher, used to work at the Dixon's Trinity Academy. Um, now there's one in Chapeltown, of course. And recently that school uh, won the award of, um, of being a, a fairer school in the Telegraph and Argus. But I asked my sister, who's a science teacher, I said, will you ask the most talented of your final year art students to create art pieces for our walls? That was the brief. Those 15 and 16 year olds produce artwork like this. Incredible. This is just two or three. I don't know how much you can see of that. It's not a great photo, but they created, I think, six pieces. I invited them to the practice. We got them lunch to say thank you. And there's also a letter with their signatures uh, that accompanies this artwork. They focus on a particular artist and the aim of these pieces was to introduce colour into the waiting room as a way of helping people whilst they're waiting and pondering about their health, their problems and the situations that they find themselves in. So I really, really hope that I've been able to demonstrate three real ways of how we're introducing art into our world of medicine. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Mo. That really reminded me of my time running arts programs in hospitals, especially what you said about the depressing stuff that was there before. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to David McQuillan, who's the Arts and Health Program Manager from Southwest Yorkshire NHS Foundation Trust. David, over to you. Thank you, Victoria, and hi, everyone. Um, so I'm quite new um, within the, the NHS and within the health service altogether. I only started my post on the, the 1st of September this year. Um, before that, I was chief executive of um, an arts organisation. So I come from the, the arts sector rather than the health sector. Um, towards the end of last year, I had my own lived experience of, of uh, mental health. I found myself with um, secondary mental health services and that led to a few, a few changes in my life. I've been working within the arts on arts and health work for about 18 months before that. And it was something that I was very passionate about. And the question about what is it about the arts is, is really interesting and stepping into the, the world of the NHS with all of the research you can pick up so the, the World Health Organization report details out what it is about the arts that is so effective and that is that it works on, on multiple levels. Um, it, there's an aesthetic level, there's an emotional level and there's a, there's a social level which backs up my, my belief that I'd, I'd always held that the arts was more effective than other positive activities, say joining a running club or, or a gardening club. During my, my time working at Square Chapel in Halifax and during my own crisis, I had a thought personally what it was to me that I thought the arts did differently and, and why the arts were so effective. And it was very much about vulnerability um, and the sense that arts can be effective even if you are participating, if you are making or creating, but they're also effective and have health benefits if you are observing or listening or attending a performance. And I think that that's because if you're creating something or you're emotionally engaging with something that somebody else has created, you are opening yourself up in a way and you are opening up a, a sense of vulnerability in a positive sense, in the sense that vulnerability and that fragility is one of the most amazing and beautiful things about us as, as humans. And I think when you are in that space and you're listening to somebody else's music or watching somebody's performance or performing or creating yourself 
the connections that you make are just much more profound than they are in other walks of life because you both have that access to your own kind of innate vulnerability and to that your humanity one of the things that always stuck with me through the participatory projects that we did at Square Tap and that I've done in the arts is how they impacted on people's identity. So we would work with lots of people that would come to the project who would identify as something to do with their condition. So they would identify as I'm so-and-so and I've got an eating disorder. I'm so-and-so, I suffer from anxiety and depression. At the end of that, project and the experience when we'd ask them um, to tell their story it was so interesting how that had disappeared they had they the way that they described themselves and the, the identity that they held for themselves was different and it was much more wrapped up in in what they did and what they created within the project so to to round up for me i think what the arts do importantly and i think to pick up on what mo said here about no man is safe without a hobby i think there have been studies dating back to the 70s that show if you take away that sense of kind of enjoyment, the, the sense of doing something where you experience that state of flow, where you're doing something not because it's essential, but because you want to do it. For me, that's drawing or painting. But if you take that away, people become incredibly unhealthy um, quite quickly. I think it was two or three days into the study where they took a group, of, a cohort of healthy, happy people and asked them to stop doing things that they enjoyed. I think they had to stop the experiment after two or three days because they all exhibited symptoms of um, serious mental health disorders. And I think the arts, as well as connecting you to other people and do something that connects you to something much greater and bigger than yourself, gives an individual autonomy, um, a sense of control that might be lost if you're feeling ill, um, a sense of purpose, and a sense of relatedness, which, by which I mean a sense of belonging. And I think belonging is different from fitting in. And I think what that connection to other people, that profound connection you get by being vulnerable um, and exposing yourself in that way, gives you a sense of belonging. It's not a sense of, of fitting in. It's being accepted for, for who you are, being certain and confident in your own identity um, and, and doing something positive. Um, that's it. So thank you. I'll pass back to Victoria to introduce the next panelist. Thanks, David. That's a really, yeah, it's a really interesting point about vulnerability and belonging and how those two might go together or be kind of jointly enabled by engaging in creative activity. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Angela Awur, who is the founder and CEO of Mental Health the Arts. Angela, over to you. Thank you, Victoria. Hi, everyone. Um, I um, will tell you a bit about myself and my personal journey with the arts and then go into what we've done with Mental Health the Arts. So I've been a long term carer for my mum who was diagnosed um, with paranoid schizophrenia and I've been caring for over 10 years. Um, just a background, so I'm from inner, inner South London and um, I came from a council estate with poverty and bad social housing. Um, and so I grew up being quite depressed and suffered quite heavily with suicidal thoughts. And my way of rebelling during my teenage years was to go out partying and raving with my friends who were 18 year olds while I was 14. But something that I realized was that I love dance and listening to music made me come out of myself. So outside of raving, I was quite very reserved, suppressed a lot of my emotions and feelings. And in school, when I did have an explosive moment, they would just say, oh, you needed anger management. Because at the time, there was no sense of, there wasn't any therapy. There was just like a school nurse. So for me, dance enabled me to express my emotions. And it wasn't necessarily me dancing really aggressively. But for me, it was like searching the innermost part of my being and expressing myself through movement. And so over the years, dance for me has felt like healing. Um, healing from trauma, healing from like negative emotions and thoughts. And over the years, that's changed me in terms of like, I've gained a lot of self, um, self, 
gains more self-esteem, gains more confidence. I'm much more bolder in expressing myself and my opinions. And in fact, it's given me the edge I needed to be able to speak out more um, on my personal journey. Specifically with um, culture and how culture, I think, plays into my personal experiences, whether it's going to a museum and looking at artifacts from Africa or going to a concert and listening to like traditional music, I feel at home. And I think that's what a lot of the emergence of art or the merge of arts and culture enables people from black and ethnic minority groups or migrants or refugees. It helps us to feel like we're back at home again. And sometimes the movement from coming from your hometown to a host country there's a lot of change and you're not always um, familiar, that you're not familiar with. So arts and culture brings you that sense of belonging, which David spoke about, um, sense of belonging, and also is part of your multicultural identity. Specifically with mental health, the arts, and I started that off the back of being a carer, becoming a carer, and also just not seeing anything to do with the arts, specifically with young people. So initially when I started, it was a platform for young people to express themselves through the creative arts. And that was just me giving a, a, like enabling any young person who was creative to just share their creativity on a platform, which was quite public. And through that, we've seen young people as young as 13, 11, to older people um, have basically used come and express the arts and actually they've told me that the platform helped them give them the boost to be able to do other things so we had um well she wasn't young but we had an a older lady um at the time I think she was like 30 35 who came and she actually performed at my first ever event and now she's gone on to start her own charity in the creative arts and she's been able to share her story across so many platforms. And it's, for me, it was like, with my journey, I was like, if I wasn't, let me be the first person to try it. And if it doesn't work, then of course it doesn't work. But at least I've shared and given people a platform to, to be able to do that. So we've done events and we've done, um, we've done events. We've, um, we did social action projects with the National Citizen Service. So that was working with... like a problem uh, at that time so in 2015 yeah I mean I, I can take over here as well um, yeah in 2015 the obviously different age group but similar to Angela I, I was a carer uh, for my mum um, she had dementia my father died in my die I died and um, she then she got dementia so she did need care so I stopped working um, and helped to look after her. But by, um, as Angela will also know, um, it's, it's, it's all engrossing. When you're looking at, you don't have any time for yourself when you're a carer. It's very difficult to make time. It's, diff it's easy to make the excuses and say, well, I haven't got time, I've this to do, I've that to do. And it's also finding an opportunity. Um, and I'd picked up a leaflet about, um, a community project called Young at Arts um, and I'd showed it to Mike and then as you do I put it to one side and, and thought nothing else of it. Um, so I'm going to put it out and say <laughs> that uh, I looked at it as well as, as Helen said and I thought we, we have to do this uh, because we need to get Helen out, we need to get Helen for at least an hour a week thinking of something different from caring and yeah because I was suffering from depression and anxiety and I very much relate to and find it quite emotional listening to what David and Angela said um, because I too have suffered from depression and anxiety um, the first time ever was when I had postnatal depression I don't need to go into that but you know sometimes then you are more susceptible to have these sorts um, have issues um, so yeah very much looking after my mum I did get bogged down with it um, because you, you are, you are, you're the person there that's in, um, you feel a lack of control. I don't know if Angela, you felt like that, but you, you, I think it, a lot of things with the, um, mental health is a lack of control in your life. And that makes it a lot worse. 
Um, but whereas when I then went along to these the Young Arts Project, which she wasn't going to do, only, yes, only sorry, day. We're, we're jumping she about a bit, and we'll so, just, yeah. We'll, so Helen wasn't wasn't going to go, uh, going to go, uh, but in, in, in well, I, I made a go, um, and we, so so we turned up. I, I knew that if I, I my intention was that I would then actually drop Helen off, and I would and I because it. And the arts weren't work for me. I didn't want to do anything uh, of that nature, so I was going to walk off. But then I realised straight away that when I said I'm, I'm thinking of going off, she said, "Oh well, I'll come with you." I said, no, no, you have to stay. So, so because Helen had to stay, I then stayed, and we went back then the week after, and the week after, and the week after, and then we got involved in the arts. We've we've not looked back since, which is why. It's made so much difference to Helen mm. by us doing that, and and from then we've we've sought out any and every event that we could find within within our neighbourhood, Leeds, as it were, and, and we've joined in. But, yeah, because it's opened it's opened so many doors because this the original um, Young Arts was a project. I don't know if any of you know about it, but it was a project that was a joint project between uh, Yorkshire Dance, um, the Grand Theatre. Leeds Playhouse, so it was it was quite a few different different places, um, and that got us to try out different things. Um, and I don't know whether you want us to answer the question: what difference does it what difference do the arts make to mental health and our well being? Which I think quite a lot of you have covered anyway, and and it's made such a mass, massive difference because when you're suffering from depression and anxiety, it's like you have you're in a fog. It's like you don't exist. Um, you don't feel part of the world, you don't feel part of life, um, you have no self-confidence, self-esteem, you sort of, you've lost your own identity. Um, well, that is my experience. Uh, and so this was just such a wonderful experience. Um, you were able to, you felt you were freed from the worries um, for that, while you are interacting and whatever activity we do within the arts, you're so engrossed in it, um, and it's the it's the physical interaction, it is the emotional interaction, and the most important thing is the human interaction. It's sharing with other people. It's massive. That is the massive thing. It reconnects you with society. It reconnects you with other people, um, and it allows you to start to live again. And I I, I would then. I'm going to add, add on from that just 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 to highlight um, that yes we get the so social interaction because then we're not just sitting at home uh, watching the telly or anything like that um, but we've become uh, fairly confident speakers um, if we can keep our well from a personal point of view if I keep my emotion in check um, and if I don't interrupt <laughs> <laughs> we've we've danced as I say we've done the flash mob yeah. we've done creative writing we've done We've told stories in public, we've told stories on the radio, um, we've done the, the, the play in a day, the film in a weekend. But the final sentence that I want you to just focus on for a, for a moment is the arts give you life back. Yeah, yeah, they do. And it's opened up such a, a variety because we took that first, it's taken that first step. And that first step was very difficult. And we know that first step for other people is very difficult. And I think that's irrespective of age. Um, we have tried very hard in a lot of the things that we've done, the activities, the production, um, everything, uh, is trying to get in people, people involved. I mean, ours is um, primarily age 55 plus. Except we're mid 60s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Um, but when you go around, so we've done knocking on doors, not just a leaflet drop, so leaflet doesn't do it. We've knocked on doors, trying to encourage people, say what it's done for us. But as I think, so I did read something, um, that one of you had written, or one of the pieces in Beyond Measure, was sometimes when you say the arts and culture, the shutters come down for people who have not had that experience before. And they say, it's not for me. But then if, if, you, if you could draw it out of them a bit more, most of them have been to the theatre, they like music, they like dance. Um, it's that 
I think it's, it's how you approach it's how you approach it. It's getting over those barriers in the first place to get more people to have a go and think, yes, it is for me. So I'm I'm really heartened by the fact that um, you're now encompassing because people when you say arts, the people's perception of the arts varies. And now that you say, well, it, through COVID, it encompasses nature um, and so many other aspects. And I love the way that the GP was talking about the, um, the young people in college doing those, those um, pictures, which I thought were wonderful. It's, it's connecting people, it's giving them a reason to do it. Um, so yeah, I'm waffling on a bit now, but I, I do think there's so much that the arts does have to offer and for everybody of all ages, but it's, it's, and the, it's the practitioners that are so important. That's what we found, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And, and it's the arts that are, that are varied, as, as, as I've already mentioned. We, we've been involved in so many different things that, that have improved our life. And we never, we never dreamed that we'd be on a stage, that we'd mm. talk on the radio, that, that, that we'd do all these things that we've done. We found it inspiring, it's been, and, and we'll uh, keep going as something that we, we, we will continue to do for, for as, lo as long as we can. Um, and, but what I, I personally have found as well, though, is that men don't join in. Men don't, don't want to do the arts. And, and as I've already said, I, will, I wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for the fact that I fell into it and, and then realised how good it was. If you don't do it, you don't know how good anything is. Um, and I've tried, I do walking football um, as well. And I've tried to encourage all the walking footballers that I'm in contact with that why didn't you come along and do this or do that or do the other. And, and I think there's a, an inherent gene within the male species that says we don't do arts and we only have to get into arts if something has forced us into it like um, you know me with my wife for example something has to happen for them to actually decide they want to they want to uh, go there uh, and I say I think in, in general whereas women when when I turn up at, at events that we join in there'll be 90 percent women and, and uh, Ten percent men. If if, if you're lucky, I'm, I'm quite often the only man there, which I, I'm really disappointed for the other males because they're missing out. And I think that's probably um, I ought to stop there now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if we've talked for too long. <laughs> no, not at all. I think you're bringing up so many important points, and that that point about um, the sort of disproportion, but you know, the preponderance of women doing this work is is. I think that's reflected across the country um, and the, um, our membership within the Alliance is 80 something percent female. So it's definitely something that I think we need to look at more carefully. I'm, I might come back to that point if I may. But I was just really struck in, in so much of what all of you said that there's this, there's this sort of inherent generosity in it and that all of, all of you started off doing this because in relation to your own health perhaps and then have found all sorts of different ways of expanding that so that that you can provide more access to this work for other people whether it's through the work that you're doing Angela you, you know you were talking about that the woman who came along to your first session and started up her own organization there's this amazing sort of knock-on effect always and it, it's something that strikes me quite often that that it begins with oneself and then just becomes about you know trying to offer other people the thing that you've found has supported you which is a really amazing thing about this sector generally um i wanted to ask the panelists actually is there anything that you would like to pick up on in what um your co-panelists have said any questions that you've got for each other there was so much in there um i wanted to pick up on mike's point about gender because that's really interesting. Um, just wanted to say that I don't know if it has to do with like education and how arts is integrated into the curriculum and how normally females or yeah are more likely to do the extracurricular dance sessions or um, drama sessions and how just over time that ends up like having a domino effect and then it's just no longer a choice. Um, it's more of I'm going to watch football rather than dance or go to a, I don't know, like a spoken word 
session but then I've also seen amongst the young people that I work with I feel like I'm, I'm gonna like counteract what I said but the males that tend to join our sessions are more into spoken word and poetry rather than painting and dancing so I guess it just depends on what's being advertised and how it's promoted in different settings and what it looks like and normally like you mentioned like maybe if you're the first person to start as a male then more males will tend to join um sometimes like you said i think helen said was when it's the first the first step it's normally the hardest yeah exactly so and um we used to run singing programs in hospitals and that there was a very the, the remain, it remains a very sort of female dominated groups, but the men that have joined those groups obviously have benefited in exactly the same way. But it's, 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 it is a sort of cultural thing, isn't it? And how I really like what you say, Angela, about it sort of almost no longer being a choice. It's almost like the, it just isn't an option somehow. Um, does anybody else want to comment on that gender issue? Yeah, it's... Um... I mean, it comes up time and time again when we're talking to organisations in the community and we're discussing what projects to put on. And there's, there's always a request for what, what can we do that will attract more men? Um, and, you know, we know in, in Cold I think that the statistic is that 75% of suicides are, are, are males um, and that the, the vast proportion of them are, are within the age of, I think it's 25 to 40. But attracting old, older men to projects, attracting men generally to creative projects is a real challenge. Um, and, quite, and what people are looking for, I think, is what is the magic art form that they can come up with that will in, engage men. But I don't, I don't think that's the issue. And I can, I can speak kind of personally. I've not got any kind of broad research on the, the subject. It's, I think when you are when you are in that position that, that Mike and Helen described so well of um, feeling your own mental health kind of slip away and you feel that kind of depression, anxiety, and you, you feel that lack of control, um, it's difficult to motivate yourself to do anything. And I wonder if the difference is, is within that. So I, I had all, all the access that I needed. So I, I, tra I trained as an artist. I was a, a visual artist. I worked in an arts organisation that put on maybe four or five performances a week. I could go and see anything that, that I wanted. I had all of the opportunity in the world. But as soon as I started feeling um, unwell, I lost the any kind of inclination to do that. I lost the kind of in inspiration to do that. And it took an absolute kind of crisis for me to kind of climb back out of it again. And I, so I think we spend a long time looking for what is the art form that will interest men. Um, but perhaps what we should be looking at is how can, what is it that stops men coming forward to take part? What is it, you know, I think you referenced it before, is it to do with the fact that it's, it's vulnerable? Um, and particularly if you start to feel negatively about yourself, you expect that to to be male to be a man is connected with strength and the opposite of, of vulnerability and you're you're constantly you're trying to hide the the weakness that you see in yourself anyway because you're feeling unwell and you don't connect the two things together um i think it i've been doing quite a lot of work with our perinatal mental health team who obviously deal solely with with women but there's a growing bit of their work that is about the kind of wider family picture um, and what it is that happens to men after the birth of a, a child and that kind of loss of identity within that and what the what the impacts of that are. and I do, I, I'd be interested to know from I don't know Norm if you know of any studies or research in in the area. Thanks David I think those are really really interesting points I think the the gender divide is acknowledged um, in a lot of studies. So in our evidence review on music and singing, you know, we found some positive benefits for, for music, especially for older people, but we also noted that so many programs tend to be female dominated. And I think that goes across quite a lot of the 
the sector. And it's also in the professional art world is, you know, highly gendered. And some of the scripts that we have around what it means to be an artist, they're not always positive, but they're also strongly gendered. So the idea of the, the genius, the male genius suffering in the attic and only having any recognition after their death, you know, as June Boyce Tillman has talked about. Um, so we have these very gendered scripts that run through the whole of the arts. And so it's not surprising that participatory arts for well-being is also a kind of gendered um, phenomena. But I'm not really aware of many studies that have tackled this sort of directly. So I think it's something that is acknowledged and we always say, you know, we need to encourage more men or, um, but I think that maybe the time has come, you know, with, within a sort of broad programme of research on health inequalities to really take gender a bit more seriously. Yeah, I'd certainly agree with that. I think um, we, we had a webinar the other day which featured a really brilliant young artist called Amano Inai from the West Mids and he has just done his first exhibition which came out of his own mental health crisis and he but when he put the exhibition on he specifically targeted young men from his own community because he was very aware of this divide and the fact that he knew a lot of young men that were struggling to talk about their mental health. And he, so he wanted to use that exhibition in the same way that you've all described, you know, starts with you, you yourself and then it catalyzes all this other stuff. He, he was using that as a way of trying to support conversations with other young men. And so I think some of it is about, and it was really successful. It really did communicate something and gave people a space to talk about things that they'd felt that they hadn't felt able to discuss before. And I think it's, it's something to do with role models too. And the more men that, that talk about the value of this work, as you've done really eloquently, Mike and David, I think that, that all helps because it just makes it feel more accessible to others. Um, were there any other points that, that came up for you all in that earlier conversation? Go for it, Helen. Yeah, I thought what Angela was saying, um, I think she sort of highlighted and mentioned about education um, and, and that depends on your age as well. When, when I was, when we were back in school, because um, I went to a grammar school that was very academic um, and the opportunity for the arts just wasn't there. So we, it was a totally different learning environment from what it is now because I, I did also, uh, part of my experience has been working in schools um, with primary school children. Um, and the, the opportunities to participate in the arts were very limited for old people. Um, you didn't, if drama was, it might, it was just um, an after school project, um, a house play that might have been done every year. If you um, went down the academic route, then you, you dropped out after a year, you didn't do drama. It wasn't, even in class, you were not, as do now, they encourage children from primary age to speak up, speak out, express themselves. That is part of the um, curriculum in primary schools um, and high schools. They're given the opportunity to speak, uh, express themselves. We were not given that opportunity. So that's another thing that being able to speak um, and perform, we never, we never experienced that, whereas they do drama, drama now. Um, but I think it's very much so with the choices of, as you're going through school, you're trying to uh, choose, you go down certain routes um, and you, so yeah, I very much agree with what Angela was saying about it's, it's determined um, during your education. So education has something to, should be involved and um, make it, it's making it all right for males to do the arts so that children grow up when you see little children, they look, they're happy out there, they're happy to get dressed up. They'll dress up, girls want to be boys, boys want to be girls. They're happy to dress up, they're happy to have fun, they're happy to perform, they love performing, they love singing, they love acting. Um, but then when you get to high school, then that's, that's and, and well, even before that, that's when um, all the, the expectations, the gender expectations sort of kick in um, and yeah, I can't think of all the words for it, but so yeah, I think I think it starts with education, doesn't it? Very much so, Angela. I think it's it, it's it needs to start at school. But the, how good the arts is for you, and they've done a lot of work um, in schools over the past 10, 20 years about mental health. But it's um, I think it's it's exploring it and how the arts can help 
and it's not just dominated by well the boys go and play rugby and football um and the girls uh, do, do something else so yeah yeah a bit if, waffly there but if i can so just say something there that it would be nice if doctors started to put a prescription out that you need to go to um uh, a, a writing squad class or you need to go to a performance class uh, and not just always put, giving you a prescription for um, a, a tablet that's yeah. supposed to help you with anxiety. It would be better to prescribe, uh, go, go to uh, eight or nine of these things that you can do in, in art and find which one uh, suits you best. Yeah. I, I know that's not going to happen, but yeah. Well, <laughs> well, there is actually talk about it. I've read quite a few things about that. Wow. That's one of the ideas is, uh, is um, uh, arts and culture on prescription. It um, is. It yeah. Is, isn't it? So that is one thing that they'll yeah. the, the, the sort Bring of, it on. Yeah, one thing that I would add, and I've been thinking about this, is it's not just, it's, we did mention that it's actually the, um, the people who are running the events, um, the artists, they have to be, it's their skill and their people skills are so important um, because when you step through that door um, I do remember that first time when we did go to the Young Arts Project and we were met by this wonderful person she was so she was just lovely um, she was she she brought you in and you felt that you'd known her all your life she was warm friendly welcoming smiley, and smiley. come on in um, join in you were felt the big thing was you were felt to make you, you were comfortable all the events we've taken part in you're comfortable it's uh supportive you're important yeah you may feel part of the group um it's not judgmental that you, you can't do anything wrong you're here to have fun join in interact with other people and very much though we think we thought build when as the group's progressing is building in that social the, the um an an element of time for social interaction because we're mindful of the fact that it's you know you've got to pay for the artist you've got to pay for the room um, and that's by usually by the hour so you know you have to leave that space so the the artist might be going somewhere else but the people within the group then quite often want to socialize and have a chat and so it's it's made, it's providing some space um, it doesn't matter if it's a shared space or whatever where they can interact socially before or or after the okay. after the activity, because that's a massive part of it. You go for the activity, but then you then be, develop friendships and you you're interacting because it's the it's the human interaction as well that's important. Because yeah, you 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 end up you do an activity, but especially if if, if it's a, sh a story sharing. Um, like we have done today, very much so, was sharing life experience and the fact that then you realise that there's so many more people who have had mental health problems, and it's just it is part of life. It's life experience. It's part of life's experience because you through life as you get older, I think you look back and you realise you have to you're adapting all the time, and that they're like critical times in your life when you go you're adapting and going through pu puberty. You go to university. Um, you start to have relationships, you get married, you have a family, then, you know, your parents start to get older, you become a carer, massive role changes in your life um, when you go to work. And it's, it's, it's how do you deal with that? And if you have mental health issues surrounding that, it's, it's, you need some outlet and the arts provides and has provided through our lives, not even before this, you, ha you want an outlook, whether it's, it's music, it's going out in the countryside, it's seeing um, sculptures, it's engaging with um, other people, going to see a play. They're all things that make such a massive difference and take you out of that, mm. that internal self-thought that we all have. But some of us are prone to more negative self-thought. Yeah. And um, it's these, all the arts offers, offers you that opportunity to escape from that. They, they are offering the best because they yeah. have, because they have a, a multitude of events, if if you want to term it that, that people can go to and experiment with and try. Mm. Whereas, uh, if you talked about gardening, then that can be the most dangerous thing you can ever do to um, to yourself because 
Uh, I, I personally have experienced um, cutting the electric line with my lawnmower four times now and managed to survive. But, um, <laughs> it's not funny, is it? I'm told yeah. by my wife I better not do it again. Yeah. Um, you, you, you're on your own in the garden, so if you do have an accident, if you fall, then um, you, 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 you may be lying there for a while. You, mm. you get aches and pains because you start um, bashing the ground with your spade. Um, you are likely to get more problems gardening than, than you are at the arts, that's, that's, that's for certain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, walking, walking football, I do that, I do enjoy that. Uh, it does have a bit of social uh, aspect to it. You do get some exercise clearly. Um, but uh, it, 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 it doesn't help you to, to be able to speak on stage. It doesn't help you to be able to tell a story on the radio. It doesn't help you to do so much things. It's great. I enjoy it. But the arts, um, for your mental health, for your well-being, is it, it's, it's just the only thing you can go to, to um, in, in that respect to, to help you. That, that's my view. It, it has a more sort of multi, for something more, sorry to use a slightly pretentious term, but sort of multifactorial <laughs> um, way of affecting you, I guess. It just, you know, again, it comes, seems to come back to this thing of confidence, which a lot of you have spoken about, and the vulnerability point that came up right at the beginning and how those two things are sort of intersect with each other and everything that you just said, Helen and Mike, about how the arts support that that processing us and sort of our processing as we go through difficult you know crises in our lives and I think you know we all intuitively reach for the arts at moments of crisis even in in this sort of least um yeah even in phases in this country where there's been very little emphasis on the arts you know automatically if you're at a ceremonial moment then people draw on poetry in a way that they might not in uh, other moments in their lives um that's really I think it's really important that you brought up that point about good facilitation and how the, the people uh, running this work how vital that is for the for the for the process and it, that is a role that I think sometimes gets um, missed out and we tend to think of the arts as sort of uh, I don't know emerging from nowhere but it is very much about the people who are making that happen the facilitators or the artists or you know whatever they might be called um, there was something specific I was going to ask, but it's flown out of my head. There were some really interesting uh, follow-ups, though, in the chat. There was a couple of examples of some groups that have uh, done great work to specifically bring men into these activities in Scotland and in Leeds. Um, and an interesting point about whether opening up in a group might be a factor in the gender gap and whether that um, is something that's also off-putting to men, I guess. Um, just going back to that that point about facilitators i don't know if, if any of the rest of you have any thoughts about that they put that in the importance of that role is it something that's sufficiently recognized do you think um yeah i think so i definitely i think how you facilitate depends on how much the audience or the people you're working with can trust you so like for me, because I'm fairly young, working with younger people, they don't look at me as a like figurehead facilitator role. They look at me as big sister or my older cousin. So they're able to, I find that they engage more because of that. I think also your wording and language and how you speak um, as a facilitator also has an effect on how much people engage in the work that you're doing. Um, someone's answered asked a question about like well-being activities and I think the way you advert where you advertise and the way you speak in your facilitator role can either bring about a positive or negative um, effect on the work you're doing um, and I, I, I'm trying to find words to explain what I, I want to say but I just find that um, as a facilitator, I think the first thing you should probably do is actually try the work that you're actually advertising or doing with the people that you're working with, because the effect it has on you and the energy you have from that would also spill through into the work that you're doing. So as well as trying it out for yourself, definitely the language, what you use is, is very key and how comfortable you are with the activity will also like infiltrate into the people that you're working with as well. Um, yeah. I hope I explained that in the best yeah, way possible. You, did. you definitely did. I, th I think it's um, a lot of it's about time, isn't it? I mean, you talked 
Helena might you were talking about the sort of time around all of the work as well and how, how important those social times are and I think I think one of the things that perhaps we are seeing shift slightly is that is funders understanding of how important time is and that it isn't just a question of, of, uh, of just turning up at a space and working with a group of people all that preparatory time that you've just described Angela but also the sort of cushioning around the project is what's so important and I was going to talk a little bit about partnership at some point. I think, you know, a lot of this work that you're describing is happening in partnership and building those partnerships is such a big part of how this, this work is effective. It, it doesn't just happen in isolation. I'd, I'd be interested to hear whether you've worked, I mean, David, obviously you're working in the context of the NHS. How, how important is that sort of partnership aspect of it for you? Yeah, it's it's incredibly important. I think that it's it's that's challenging for organisations outside the NHS. Speaking from personal experience, is that it's quite complicated to understand the intricate workings of the NHS from outside of it. Where my my perception was definitely that it was just one big lovely thing called the NHS, and actually, it the structure is much more complicated than that. I think there are partnerships emerging now, and we've got some really good ones emerging in Calderdale. I think one of the areas that has come up a few times that it's interesting to talk about partnerships in connection to is social prescribing. And I think that that's, you know, I think it was really illustrative the way that Mike and Helen talked about it, because that's very much the way that most of the people I come across talk about it, which is, um, in you know, Mike said it's something that should be happening or people will talk about it as something that um, they know is sort of going to happen at some point in the future without realising that it is something that is happening now. Um, and one of the, the very real issues we have with it in Calderdale is a tension between the voluntary and community sector and the social prescribing process because I think they feel slightly put out in terms of that partnership delivery that no funding was di diverted in their direction for, for the activities that people would be referred on to. Um, and I think what we, for the partnership to work, and I think that that, that partnership solution is the way that this, this will work. And there's some interesting comments in the chat as well about kind of local authority funding. And so those, those partnerships to, to be effective, um, to deliver, population health benefits, health for people accessing secondary or primary care services. There needs to be a really transparent and open conversation about funding um, and what the, the funding level is within the, the health sector, how much of that can be commissioned to fund creative strategies, the, the funding within the primary care network for social prescribing link workers and how that might flow down to some of the arts groups, the, the voluntary community sector to deliver work because I think the, the perception, rightly or wrongly, in the arts and community sector is that it's an unequal partnership. Um, and I would say particularly this year, even more than, than years past, sustainability of arts venues, small voluntary groups, um, small arts groups is massively under threat. You know, we, in the arts sector, we, we'd all been kind of encouraged to diversify our income, and generate our own income and now all of that. So most most places would get 60% of their income from hires or people or bar sales. And that was how the Arts Council quite rightly encouraged people to develop their models. But since that's been taken away from everybody this year, I think there's a, there's a real anxiety in arts organizations that they're potentially not going to be here beyond next March. So I, it was partly in response to something I saw in the chat, but I think that there has to be a kind of transparency at the beginning of those partnership conversations about funding and money and sustainability. Yeah, 100% agree. I think, I mean, there is a bit of a step in the right direction now. The Thriving Communities Fund has just opened up, which is maybe the, I hope, will be the beginning of money that will start to flow to providers for social prescribing. I've put a link in the chat to that. But um, this maybe leads to a question from Mick Ward, actually, to all of you. So his point is that, um, cuts in local authorities are getting deeper um, and local authorities are going to be under pressure to spend on core care services and not on culture and the arts. What is your one-liner to challenge this? 
And his sub question is, what health and care services would you cut to fund it? Which you may not see. The, well, anyway, I'll see what you would like to do with that question. Anyone want to leap? Oh, you're muted, Victoria. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Norma, go ahead and then we'll come back to Helen. I was going to say very briefly that the, um, it just brought to mind that study of the Breathe Magic where they did the um, Young Magicians programme and compared it to physiotherapy output outcomes for children with um, mobility issues, hemiplegia. So they showed that the magic tricks a project training young people to be to do magic tricks basically as part of a, um, a, a summer school program had more effective outcomes than the kind of occupational therapy and physiotherapy that they were being given to give them more movement in there so if you know if you're looking at that very sort of pragmatic very healthcare commissioning kind of conversation you have to start with what is the problem that the commissioners have and how you're going to solve it rather than starting with the art form and thinking what, what can we do and I'm not suggesting that that should dictate the entire research agenda because research questions are so much more broad than that but I think if you're in that space you have to sort of start with the with the problems facing the commissioners and think about how the arts can address those not the other way around. Thanks Nora and Helen? I think I think it's bringing um, to the fore the fact that um, the benefits of the arts um, arts projects to the health and ultimately it's a bit it's all it's all joined together it's all part of the same circle um, then that reduces if it reduces anxiety and depression you've not got the same costs of um, going to go you know visits to the GP. Uh, the drugs. If you're not having to take the same the same amount of drugs, um, I know I had cognitive behaviour therapy. There are a lot of people. The, the waiting time for for therapy is is really that's that, that's that's a long one. <laughs> people are waiting a long time, and if you're suffering from anxiety and depression, you need help now, um, not in three months' time, because um, well, you, you need it in three months' time, but you, it's it's there. <laughs> And the, the hardest part about mental health is accepting it, that you've got it yourself. Taking that step to a GP and admitting that you have a problem is a massive step. And if you have then have to wait three months to receive any support, apart from, say, medication, um, it's just, it's, it, that intervention needs to be there uh, straight away. And, and the arts have a massive role to play in that. Um, and could you know it, it's it's like someone else was saying it's all it's all a big picture it needs to be um collab it's collaborative and the biggest problem is is the funding um you know i was i, I found that with all the different um, agencies that I had to contact regarding when you were a carer same in school um i did learning sports special needs um and all the different agencies it's trying to get everyone to work together um, and I, I know where you're coming from with funding, but the, the benefits to the NHS is that it will reduce, it, it reduces the need um, for people to con then contact the NHS and be treated by psychiatrists, psychologists, um, therapists, um, because it's dealing with some of the problems. So you, there's, a, there's a benefit there, a cost and a health benefit. Um, there are already a lot of arts groups working together and I think even more so that's going to become important um, within Leeds and the Yorkshire area there's arts together I think they've got over 55 definitely more than that um, different arts projects and arts providers because there's, uh, there's Opera North and um, Slung Law I know we went to a, um, an event through Yorkshire Dance and they're all co collaborate um, and I think that's another thing it's the, the funding they all get it seems from our perspective and the bit that we've had involvement in with the funding is you get a pot of money from the Arts Council, you might get a pot of money from somewhere else, but it seems to be kept within the, the um, so if it's given to Yorkshire Dance, if it's given to the Performance Ensemble, they're all understandably very precious about their pot of money. But when, because we've worked with and 
participated with the different groups, so with, with, the, with the Yorkshire Dance, Performance Ensemble, the Playhouse, um, the Grand Theatre and the other ones, you suddenly realise that well, they're all working to the same objective. So if they pool their resources, they're going to be, that money will go further. They've got more expertise and skill. If they share the skills, share the good practice, then, you know, they really need to start working together. Everybody wins. Everybody wins. It's the need to collaborate. And, and that's a big thing yeah. that we thought. But you do find, um, not saying all, but the different groups can sometimes seem as though they're very precious about their specific area. Um, yeah. And I think sometimes perhaps that's a bar that is a barrier. That's perhaps the, the way the funding happens now. Um, and I think the Arts Together project, when we there were people from all these different groups, we came together and, and that was brilliant because it did well, it, it did start conversations between the different, different groups like Chapel FM, they do a lot of, um, they're all community funded but projects, but they do a lot with the written word and poetry and music and, and, Yorkshire, yeah, and song and, and Yorkshire dance and they do a lot in the community. Yorkshire dance are brilliant within the community. They do a lot of outreach work, so do um, the Playhouse. And they've all got these skills and they've got these people who are really um, brilliant practitioners. I mean, we've come across some that are just so, they are so skilled they're, they're in, amazing. in the interpersonal skills and the way they can, it's, it's, it's a bit like when I was doing um, speech and language with children, working with children with learning difficulties. It's tiny steps. Everybody's starting from a different starting point and a different experience or a lack of experience in the arts. Um, but you, you try to make it, it's got to be inclusive. It's got to be non-judgmental. It's got to, everybody's got to feel safe. Um, and it's down to the actual uh, person who's running the event and their skill to actually de uh, set up that environment and mm. that people will share and will come and have a go and they enjoy it and, it, and have fun. And keep coming back. Yeah, and keep coming back. So it's... Yeah. And you can, by sharing, then you, you learn from each other. It's, it's like in school, teachers, they very rarely get the opportunity to see how another teacher works. Um, so it's it's that sharing of best practice, isn't it? And how do you facilitate Absolutely. that? So, um, yeah, I think that's quite important. Yeah, so there's three, I guess there's three main points that are coming out. There's the, there's, um, the preventative aspect of the arts, which, which uh, should be a sort of uh, a, a big tick in terms of, funding coming from local authorities, then there's the more kind of targeted approach that Norma was talking about, where you're looking at the, at the local priorities and how you can address those in quite a specific way. And then there's this question of collaboration across arts organisations themselves, which I think I think we're on the cusp of that being a much more common thing. Um, and certainly a lot of the arts organisations we work with do work in partnership a lot for their bids. And if that comes from the funders as well, we have, we'll be in a good position to to sort of reinforce that message um, I wanted if you don't mind I was going to move on to another question there was a question about the first step because this came up a couple of times that first to help people into um, into different activities that they're perhaps not used to um, and one person was asking about any strategies that you think um, might help people take that first step is there anything specific that the arts need to do that to try to get over this sense that people feel of it not being for them. Angela, have you got any thoughts on that one? <laughs> no, no thoughts on that. David? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. I, so I think that I've got a couple of thoughts on that. I think what in the in the arts we have uh, we has been very good at taking the work that, that we do and looking at the, the barriers that exist for people attending that work, whether that's financial or cultural or geographical, without questioning whether the work that we're doing is, is the right work. I think that's one of the, the, the studies that I think that the arts needs to do for itself, which is accepting that we, we live in a diverse community and that diverse community is going to have a diverse range of values and actually the starting point for any kind of look at accessibility within the arts should be about the work that's on our stages, the work that our, our groups are engaged in and making sure that that's appropriate. I think 
beyond that, some specific examples, one of the, the projects that I was involved with towards the end of my time at Square Tackle was um, picking up a project that I think started in Brighton, um, the, the Geek Buddies project for people with a learning disability. So it was a, it was a really simple kind of volunteering scheme that matched people up with um, a person with a learning disability with a, a buddy, a volunteer who had similar interests and they would attend cultural events or groups together. Um, and that came out of a, a very specific piece of research that discovered there was a, a, a terrifying percentage of people with a learning disability were either in bed or ready for bed at kind of seven or eight o'clock on a Friday night. And much of that was to do with the, the shifts of support workers or the, the, the payments to support workers and how that operated. And it had always been an aim of mine to introduce something somewhere that worked for multiple sectors of society. I do think that that first step, and I think illustrated by Mike and Helen talking there, that actually that first step is difficult to take on your own. So actually they were their own kind of little kind of befriending support group for it. It was a kind of like, if you don't go, I'm not going to go. Um, but actually some kind of, we talked in our CCG meetings about commissioning friendship. And I think a kind of commissioning a kind of befriending or connecting service um, that's that's one of the ways to do it. There is an institution in Leeds that does that, isn't there? One of the big theatres. I've gone blank on who. Sorry, Mike, I interrupted you. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Um, although it's simplistic, and and it, it clearly doesn't work for everybody, but just advertising a space where people can come and have a coffee and a chat. Um, is what we found uh, is is so far the best way to actually get anybody in. Uh, is, is as simple as that. If if you start trying to tell them, if you tell them that you're going to be doing dance, you're going to be doing this, you're going to be doing that and the other, um, invariably, again because it's the arts, it's oh well that's not for me, so I'm, I'm not going to go. But initially, um, just having a space where people can come, have a coffee, have a chat. And, and that happens over two or three or four weeks. And then just from that scenario, um, the facilitator may well have been taking notes of some of the stories that people were telling each other about how they got there that day, um, either well, and this, and, 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 et cetera. And, and that starts to build up a bit of a rapport. And that, that in turn then, um, when the facilitator says, uh, well, I think we, we, we might turn this into um, a little uh, mini performance. Um, suddenly, faces start to, ooh. Uh, but if they're, they're the right sort of facilitator, as in they are uh, very welcoming, etc., etc., then and they just say, no, 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 panic about it. We'll, we'll just do a little bit at a time and we'll see how it goes. And if you don't like it, then you don't have to do it. If you can't do it, then um, we'll find a way of, of how we can do it. And, and, and if, if, if that is the type of scenario you've got, then people that have come for that, that chat, that just get out of the house, because there are people that need to, so they've, they've read that, they want oh, free tea and coffee, and let's go get it. Yeah, we'll have that for free. Maybe in a cake thrown in. Um, you, then take, you then keep them, provide, provided you've got the right facilitator, as I say, that, that is not overbearing or um, well you got that step wrong when you do a little bit of dance and stuff just just be nice and welcoming and um, allow people to as I say first of all just gradually get into the groove of being there and then from there you can get them to start doing something else and a bit of writing and a bit of this uh, and yeah that that do, it does work but you know, you yeah. can get hundreds in, but it, it is it is a small way of getting people in. Sort of pace, isn't it? Getting and building a safe space first, yeah. rather than um, starting necessarily from the from that from the arts bit. Yeah. Um. Anybody else want to come in on that? I've got another question. If not, no. Okay. Um. So this is from Robin Dowland. 
at the Centre for Cultural Value, we've been reviewing literature of different topics that fall under the culture, health and wellbeing umbrella. And a lot of the published literature focuses heavily on outcomes over process. So how might, how might we rebalance the scales so that we can showcase the importance of the in the moment arts and cultural experiences? Go for it, Norma. I think that's something that I've been saying for quite some time that the, the, the kind of research paradigms are in a way borrowed from uh, evidence-based healthcare where it's really all about showing outcomes. And I think if you want to show an outcome, like a reduction in depression or you know, something very tangible, then that's clearly the right research model. But the whole range of arts and health experience is so much broader than that, that we, you know, those sorts of research models aren't going to give you answers to other kinds of questions about maybe the gender issues or the ethnicity issues or the experiences of people who take part in some of these projects and also I think behind that there's an assumption that if we just only can produce the right outcomes and tick that box then suddenly we'll all you know the arts will be funded so I think there's a kind of pragmatic sense that we need to show these outcomes in order to justify being funded which is kind of true but then there may be also instances where we do show outcomes and it doesn't still doesn't necessarily result in more funding because maybe those outcomes aren't the ones that privileged or prioritized by commissioners or maybe that's a good well-being outcome but there isn't an associated cost saving so it's really complicated but I think there's a if we take a step back there's another level to this which is about how do we understand and how do we research ourselves as a sector so what are the political social and kind of geopolitical processes that uh, lead to some things being recognized some things not being recognized things about um, scaling up and all those questions about how we operate and su succeed as a, as a movement are really, to me, they're important research questions that we should be asking. So that's why I've been looking at things like social movement theory and also at boundary work and boundary objects and looking at artists as boundary workers who have to shift between different sectors and um, you know what makes a successful boundary object or what makes a successful boundary project I think are really important things to understand so we need some of our research agenda to be addressing some of these questions and not just trying to measure outcomes as if that's the kind of the holy grail although it is important but it's it's certainly not everything I think that work that you've been doing on um, social movements Norma is so helpful and just giving us a, a completely different angle on this work that that stops us from getting trapped in, I suppose, sort of competing ideas about which art form is better than which other art form and all of those kinds of questions which have haunted us for a while, I think. Um, Angela, it looks like you would like to answer the, the question on funding, is that right? Yeah, so one of my other hats is I work for the Paul Hammond Foundation as a programme coordinator, so I have a little bit of knowledge around that. Um, so the question was asked specifically, um, are funders informed by researchers? And the question is no, not all the time. It depends on what type of fund it is. I know for um, the Paul Hamlin Foundation, there is a, I think it's called Arts for All Fund, something like that. And um, I know specifically there is someone who is a, like, who is a researcher who's, sorry, hired as a researcher to give insight into the work but that doesn't mean necessarily that the person so the person the candidate that's applying for the front has that knowledge prior um, and then the second question was should a grant award mean that a funder will connect you to an academic research program so not necessarily and something that I would suggest which I've done is when I have a specific project that I'm working on so for example I did a pilot program for carers last year called the, um, the arts program and I specifically requested on like social media for a academic researcher to come on board because then that helps with evaluation in the long term and not all the time um, the grant funder wouldn't always connect you with an academic researcher because I don't know I don't think that's always their remit to do so so definitely like spread your wings or uh, or your net wider cross your net wider to ensure that you have an 
an academic research on board because that will help with evaluation in the long term. I hope I answered the question. I think that's really good advice about um, about forming relationships with researchers. And uh, if you if you're working on a sort of longer term program, I'd really recommend that. I think often we feel under enormous pressure to do all of the work of evaluating and researching ourselves, and it's 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 impossible. You can't have the objectivity you need necessarily, and and there is huge sort of willingness and skill out there if you can connect with the right institution. Um, and if anybody specifically needs help with that kind of thing, then um, we'd be very happy to offer advice through our regional champions. Um, and so, yeah, do feel free to get in touch with us about that kind of thing. Um, do, do, do. Someone in the chat mentioned moving to a more digital world in the current time and digital poverty. Uh, I, yeah, I suppose it's a general question about um, how you think this specific moment is affecting what we're all doing and how is that impacting the value of the arts, which I'm very interested in myself. Has anybody got any thoughts about that shift into digital? How's that impacted your work? David? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's deeply challenging. Uh, and having started this, this project within um, this year of restrictions, it's but started the planning for it about 18 months ago. So it's, it's really interesting to see a project that we all envisaged would go one way um, because the, the world had never heard of COVID, have to adapt um, immediately. So it's not a pro, a pro, an existing project that had to adapt. It was just an idea that had to adapt. And I think the focus for, for us has to be on what, what projects can you do where the, there's a digital element, but how that actually fosters a connection with people that like, so whether that's within a household or within a, a support support but also one of the one of the projects that we're looking at is um Carnegie Hall's um lullaby project so working with our perinatal mental health team so that's actually that's pairing up um new and expectant parents with musicians so that that interaction can happen digitally but the outcome of that, that project is a personalised lullaby that um, that family then have with their, their new baby and that encourages greater mental health, um, greater parent-child bonding in that, in that early years and a reduction in, in postnatal depression. And I think that that's been the key for us this year is how can you use, um, whether it's digital, post-based, phone-based interventions to encourage interpersonal connections in what's become a much smaller world for everybody um, but I think that genuine human connection is still important. The digital poverty aspect is is enormously as we've seen with kind of health inequalities everything has just been exaggerated this year by the, the pandemic so that levels of poverty and digital poverty are being exacerbated and we work in many areas where the, one of the most important considerations you can make for digital work is that it is accessible from a phone um, and that, that access to a computer, a desktop or a laptop computer is, is not always possible. Um, I think you still run into issues to do with, with data and cost and economy, but that's been the only solution that we, we can make, particularly once, once libraries are closed and people can't engage to, to um, computer libraries. I mean, it's, I think, not to make it a political point, but I think there was perhaps a bit of amusement when Corbyn suggested um, a kind of digital infrastructure that would give high speed broadband to every family. But I think actually nobody would have known that what's happened this year would have happened, but that would, would actually have been a massively valuable investment. It would. Thanks, David. And uh, gosh, this has flown by. It's um, five two, so that's all we have time for as a panel. I'm going to hand over to Erica. Sorry that we couldn't talk about that more because it's a it's a huge area, but I'm sure the conversations can carry on elsewhere. Erica, over to you. 
Hello. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, just a quick wrap up from me. Yeah, the two hours have, or well, nearly have really flown by. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panel, um, Norma and David, Mike and Helen, Angela and Mo, and particularly Victoria for brilliant chairing and making sure that we got through a lot of those questions. Thanks to everybody for their thoughtful and insightful contributions. And to those of you that have posted questions and made comments as well, and also for, um, for for giving up your time today to come and hear what, what everyone has to say. As I said at the top, we have another couple of uh, events this week, one tomorrow lunchtime, 12 till 2, which is all about um, collaboration. There's a link to that in the chat. If not, you can find it on the Beyond Measure website. And Thursday is the In Conversation with Darren Henley and Daisy Fancourt um, from the Beyond Measure team. Thank you very much for, uh, for chipping in today and uh, look forward to seeing you another time. Thanks very much.